So after that, let's now go to question number eight. So question number eight is asking, name the element present in the following compounds. So such a question we have dealt with in question number two, I guess. Earlier on, you have dealt with such a question. So name the elements present in the following compounds. So the first compound is zinc sulfide. As how we had said in the previous, uh, the previous question, so if you are being given a word formula like this one, zinc sulfide, so you, first of all, you should write this in terms of chemical formula in order for you to know exactly how many elements are present in the, in the compound. So we have been given zinc sulfide. So zinc sulfide is the word. So how do we write it in chemical form? So zinc sulfide is written as Zn then S. So ZNS is zinc sulfide. Since it ends in IDE, sulfide. So since it ends in IDE for the sulfide, it means that that is only one element. So remember, if it, if it is a sulfate, if we say sulfate, it will mean that it has oxygen, whereby oxygens are four. If it is a sulfite, ITE, it will mean that, yes, it has also an oxygen, but oxygens are only three. So remember this word, sulfide, it means that it is only sulfur. If it, ends with, if it ends with IDE, it will only mean that it is only that element that you have been told, sulfide. So sulfide, it means that it is only one element which is sulfur. So it ends with IDE. But if you have been told it's a sulfate, so sulfate with ATE ending with ATE, it means that there are four oxygen atoms in the structure. And if you have been told it's a sulfite, it, uh, which ends with ITE, it will mean that there are three oxygens in the structure. So in this case, this is zinc sulfide ending with IDE. So for this zinc sulfide, if we are to draw uh, the formula, so the formula is going to be Zn then S. So the valency of zinc is 2 positive, the valency of sulfur is 2 negative. So if we write Zn and then we write the valency of sulfur below it, which is 2, and then for sulfur we write the valency of zinc, which is 2. So these valencies are going to cancel each other out to get zinc 1 and sulfur 1. So in this case, zinc sulfide has only one zinc and one sulfur in the structure. So apart from that, Roman 2 is asking sodium nitrate. Now, this, this word nitrate is ending with A-T-E to make sodium nitrate. So if we have been told sodium nitrate, for nitrate, it will mean that there are full number of oxygen, whereby for nitrate now, it will mean that the full number of oxygen should be three oxygens. So remember, for sulfate, for sulfate, it will mean that there are four oxygen. That is for sulfate. But for nitrate, anything nitrogen, if it ends with ATE, it will mean that it has full number of oxygen atoms, which is three. So in this case, we have been told uh, sodium nitrate ending with ATE. So first of all, we know that we have sodium and then we have nitrate and then we should have some oxygen. So writing the chemical formula of sodium nitrate is going to be NaNO3. So it will mean that we have one sodium, one nitrogen and three oxygen. So in this case, we have sodium, nitrogen, and oxygen to make up sodium nitrate. Yeah. So apart from that, let's now go to the next question, whereby this question is now a question on the Bunsen burner. So this question number nine is asking, the figure below shows a type of a flame produced by the Bunsen burner, as you can see. So that is the flame that we have having regions A, B, and C. So those are the regions that you have been given in this case. So question letter A is asking, name the parts of the flame labeled A, B, and C. So if you can check the, the arrow pointing region A, so it's the topmost arrow. So this topmost part of the flame is always called the pale blue region. So avoid saying blue region, avoid saying blue region only. So give it the full name, pale blue region. And then for this region, avoid also saying pale bluish, never include the ish and ish never include the ish in naming colors in chemistry because if you include ish in naming any color in chemistry you're surely going to get it wrong so never include any ish in color naming in chemistry you're going to get it wrong so in this case it will be wrong for us to say pale bluish or just say bluish that ish will give you a wrong so the correct answer in this case will be pale blue region so region letter b 
uh, below pale blue region so region letter b is referred to as the green blue region again avoid saying greenish blue or avoid saying green bluish if you include that ish you are going to get it wrong in color naming in chemistry so only use the letters as they are so this region is referred to as the pale blue region so region letter c below now the pale uh, rather not the pale blue but the green blue so region let us see now below the green blue region which is letter b so this is almost colorless region or region of unburned gases so that's the name given to this region the almost colorless region or region of unburned gases so that is that in naming of the part so let's look at question letter b so question letter b is asking name the type of flame uh, above so name the type of flame above so this type of flame is referred to as the non luminous flame so non-luminous so remember the word luminous comes from the word luminosity to illuminate to give light so this non-luminous means that it doesn't produce light or it produces very low amount of light that's why it's called a non-luminous flame so you should remember the opposite of non-luminous flame is a luminous flame now luminous flame from the word luminosity it means that this is a flame which lights up or gives light luminous flame so that's a luminous flame but the non-luminous flame is called non-luminous because it produces very low light it's a, it has a very low luminosity process or luminosity adaptability of the surrounding so it gives very low light that's why it's called a non-luminous flame so the flame above the flame is called a non-luminous flame because it produces less light it will be wrong for you to say that it it doesn't produce light here yeah. because if you see that blue flame produced by the gas when the gas is cooking so yes there is some light even though there is some low light but there is some significant light so it is wrong for you to say that it doesn't produce light you should say it produces less light so apart from that question let us see is asking which part of the flame above is the hottest so the part of this flame above which is hottest is region a so part a is the hottest avoid giving the full name that you have been asked to name so in this case the question is asking which part of the flame is the hottest so remember that diagram doesn't have pale blue that is the name that you have given you have labeled it as pale blue so since you are the one who has labeled this region as pale blue so the question is not asking what you have labeled so the question is asking the parts labeled above so you should not say it's the pale blue region. You're going to get it wrong. But you should say it's part A. So if you say it is part A, because that is what is in the diagram. So if you say it is part A, you get it correctly. But if you say it's pale blue, chances of you getting it wrong are very high. So this question is specific and it's asking which part of the above flame. So which part? Is it A, is it B or is it C? So avoid giving it the name that you have labeled so only say it is part a so part a is the hottest and not the pale blue region that you have labeled so many students make this mistake so don't be a statistic of a student who made the same mistake so looking at this question you have been asked which part of the flame above is the hottest so it is part labeled a so part labeled a is the part which is the hottest in this flame so apart from that question letter d is asking State three apparatus used in the laboratory for heating. So state three apparatus used in the chemistry laboratory for heating. So in this question, this question is general. This question is open. So anything, even at home, anything that can be used to produce heat can be used as an answer in our question. So anything. If anything produces heat, you can use this one as the answer for our question. Like for example, we have the Bunsen burner, which is the basic to produce heat in the laboratory. We have the Bunsen burner. We have the candle because candle produces heat. So we have the candle, we have the stove, we have the electric heater, we have the water heaters, also we have sunlight. As long as it can be able to produce heat, that can be an apparatus which can be used in the chemistry laboratory for heating. Even we have a, a JICO, we can also use a JICO to, for heating in the chemistry laboratory. So this question is just open. The apparatus which are used in the chemistry laboratory for heating is just open name anything that can be used to produce it in the laboratory the only thing that you should not name in this is a matchstick because if you are to heat a glass apparatus 
how many matchsticks are we going to light in order to eat the apparatus? So that is the only one that you are going to get it wrong. But all the other apparatus which can be used even out here for heating can be, a, uh, can be an apparatus that can be used in the laboratory to produce heat in the laboratory. Yeah. So apart from that, let's look at question number 10, which is the next question. So this question is asking, explain why most apparatus in the laboratory are made of glass. So this is a very common question. Explain why most of the apparatus in the chemistry laboratory are made of glass. So why do you think most of the apparatus are made of glass? Yes, we have plastic apparatus, we have wood apparatus, but, but most of the apparatus in the laboratory, they are made of glass. So why do you think they are made of glass? So the first one is, is because glass, glass apparatus are easy to clean. So after we have done many experiments using these chemicals, colored chemicals, so to clean glass apparatus is easier. So it is very easy to clean glass apparatus. So that is the first one. So also, glass apparatus, they enhance visibility of the experiment taking place inside. So if you use glass apparatus, so the experiment which are taking place inside the glass will be clearly visible from outside. So it will be easy for us to see the color changes inside the apparatus whereby the experiment is taking place. So for easier visibility and monitoring of the reactions which are taking place inside the apparatus. So that is the next point. So the third point we see that glasses, they rarely react with mineral acids. So glasses, they rarely react with chemicals in the laboratory. So like unlike the plastic apparatus, apparatus or the wood apparatus, so some of them may react with strong chemicals, but glass apparatus, they rarely react with the chemicals found in the laboratory. So apart from that, you see that glass apparatus are durable. So yeah, so the glass apparatus are very much durable as compared to the other apparatus uh, that we have in the laboratory, among others. So let's look at now the B part of that question. So the B part of that question is asking, name any two apparatus in the laboratory which are used to measure the volume. So the apparatus which are used in the laboratory to measure volume. So these ones are mainly, we have the pipettes, we have the burette, we have the um, round bottom flask, we have the graduated beaker, we have the measuring cylinder, just any apparatus, including syringe, which can be used to measure the volumes in the laboratory. We have syringe, we have graduated jugs, we have the volumetric flask. There are very many apparatus used to, to measure volume in the laboratory. So if you can just be able to mention or understand about five, you'll be good to go. If you've been asked a question, name the apparatus which are used to measure volumes in the laboratory. So you have your five apparatus that you must give, the pipette, the burette, conical flask, round bottom flask, you have the measuring cylinder, you have the syringe, volumetric flask, etc. So if you can just be able to mention them or just understand those five, you'll be good to go. So apart from that, let's now go to question number 11. So question number 11 is asking, define the term matter. So what is matter? In science also we defined matter, uh, I guess if I'm not wrong. So whereby we say that matter, uh, this is anything that has weight and occupies space. So that is matter. Anything which has weight and occupies space, now that is matter. Whereby for the three states of matter, remember we saw that we have solids, liquids and gases. So those are the three states of matter. So we that we are going to continue the chemistry in the upcoming classes, we are going also to see that we have another state of matter which is referred to as the plasma. So for matter we see that we have four states, whereby we have uh, solids, liquids, gases and plasma, which is basically moving energy or floating energy. But in high school we have the three states of matter that we study, so we have solids, liquids and gases. Whereby for this matter, remember we also checked on kinetic theory of matter, and for the kinetic theory of matter, remember we say that it states that matter is made up of particles that are in constant random motion, whereby it comprises of solid particles which are closely packed together, liquid particles fairly packed, and then gas particles, they are far apart. So remember, those are the things that we studied in the previous classes here at ETC. So in this question, we are being asked to define matter. So matter, matter is anything that has weight and occupies space. So that is matter. So the next question, which is letter B, is asking state the three states of matter. This is simple. We have solids, we have liquids, 
and then you have gases. So those are the three states of matter that we have. So the question, the next question is asking, describe what happens to particles when solids are heated. So describe what happens to particles when solids are heated. Now this one gets us back down to kinetic theory of matter that we have just defined or that we have just, yeah, defined. So what is kinetic theory of matter? So we must first of all understand kinetic theory of matter in order for us to answer this question. So what is kinetic theory of matter? So kinetic theory of matter states that matter is made up of particles, that is one, that are in constant random motion, that is two, whereby solid particles are closely packed together, liquid particles fairly packed together, gas particles wide apart, that is three. So for kinetic theory of matter, you must mention all those three aspects of kinetic theory of matter. So matter is made up of particles that are in constant random motion, whereby solid particles closely packed together and gas particles wide apart. So what happens when solids are heated? So such a question, we are supposed to talk about the solid particles and then from solid particles we go to liquid particles, this is what will happen, and then gas particles. But this question is specific, what happens when solids are heated? So when we heat solids, we see that the particles of matter, now the particles of solids are going to absorb heat. So we are heating the solid. So these particles are going to absorb heat. After absorbing heat, these particles are going to begin vibrating. So after vibrating, these particles are going to begin to move apart. Why? Because the intermolecular forces between these particles are becoming weak. So these are the points in answering such a question. So when solid particles are heated, number one, the particles are going to absorb heat. That is obvious. After absorbing heat, we are going to say that the intermolecular forces between the particles are going to become weak. So after absorbing heat, these particles, intermolecular forces are the, are the forces which are holding